Starfall is a science fiction Minecraft animation which takes place in an original universe. I've wanted to create a sci-fi story on a much larger scale than anything I've done before, and with added voice acting. Thankfully, a lot of people shared my excitement, and a team was formed to put all this together. This is Starfall. Hello there, Samuel Kyber here, and welcome to the behind the scenes of Starfall. This is going to take a while to go through, so I'm doing this one a little differently. I'll be breaking things down into different categories, starting with how we came up with the story, then moving on to the designing the art, followed by building all the maps, and ending with a scene by scene breakdown of the animation. There will be timestamps in the description if you'd like to skip to a specific part, so let's get started. I've always been a huge fan of science fiction. Mass Effect is one of my favourite games and was a huge inspiration for the animation. However, a lot of successful series like Lord of the Rings and Star Wars and Game of Thrones tend to have this big enemy force that gives everyone else a reason to put aside their differences and band together to save the world. I wanted to do something a little differently and focus primarily on the characters and their conflicts. The first few ideas for Starfall came from the idea of having the collapse of a nation be what upsets the balance of power in the universe, representing the old world dying and a new world of chaos taking its place. I always had this vision right from the get-go which was Anyone can build anything. The ending would be the fall of a nation, to really get across what kind of universe this is going to be. Series like Death Note and Attack on Titan have been major influences in that regard. Owen is the main character we follow in Starfall. He's an experienced pilot and talented engineer, creating his own tools, weapons, ship modifications, and even ship himself. This allows him to lead quite an independent lifestyle, though events in his past are the true cause of his isolation. I tried to make him quite charismatic and fun to help create exciting action scenes and playful banter between him and Chip. He used to be part of a bounty hunter guild known as the Striders, along with Kira, doing questionable contracts out in the more dangerous regions of space. But a life of what we refer to as morally grey became too much for him and he decided to look for a life with more safety and stability. This also gave them a lot of depth as characters, knowing both Owen and Kira have this long history with the Striders. Kira was a very difficult character to get right. She's very extroverted and perceptive, which gives her an edge in dealing with situations. She was inspired by characters like the Joker or Light Yagami, which incidentally is where the name Kira comes from. She has a long history with Owen working alongside him on previous contracts for the Striders, forming a strong and playful bond along the way. At this moment in time, we don't really know too much about Kira and her species. I decided to have electromagnetism be part of her aesthetic, which you can see in her weapons and her use for the EMP at the end. We'll be getting to that later. The name Starfall came from a long process of throwing around a bunch of sci-fi terms and mixing them with one another until one stuck. The name also conveys the theme of the series, especially at the end with the fall of a nation. When it came time to write the script, I created a short breakdown of the main story events, followed by a much more detailed breakdown of everything that happens. Oh, blimey. After the story was finalised, I moved on to writing the script, and created a layout version first without any of the final dialogue, and then I went through and gave the dialogue more character with the help of the script editors. I set up a page on Casting Call Club which had over a thousand auditions in total, so it was very difficult to choose the voice actors for the characters. I'm extremely happy with the cast that I picked though, they, they really outdid themselves. As the story was being written and the voice lines being recorded, my team of artists were working on bringing this world to life. This is the first animation on BPS to have concept art created for the various characters, locations and assets. I really wanted to give things a distinct look, especially as we were deviating away from the traditional Minecraft feel. Custom skins were designed and various models and rigs were created. Owen Ryder's concept was designed by Kurt Dustin. We ended up going for a very clean but adventurous design with the various layers of cloth and armour and his signature blue sash on his shoulder. His skin was designed by Lux and she managed to pull off such a complex skin onto much fewer pixels which I was really impressed with. His weapon designs went through a few different ideas before we landed on a simple concept using colour to distinguish between the different attachments. The weapons were modelled by Red Blue 115 and he was able to match the concepts perfectly. 
Owen also has a helmet which he uses in space, this was modelled by Phoenix209, but somewhere along the line I must have broken it at some point because it used to have this cool animation where it would kind of transform and wrap itself around the back of his head, but it kind of went a bit wrong. <laughs> Owen also has an attachment on his back, which Chip can attach to. Kira's design is one of my favourites in Starfall. Her concept was done by Lost in Time, who managed to create such an iconic look for Kira. Her armour had so many different looks, but we definitely wanted it to be sharp and dangerous. It was important for her to look distinct when next to Owen, so the characters don't blend together too much, so we went with blacks and purples. We gave her spines on her head instead of hair, along with two horns to really sell the idea that she wasn't human. Kira's skin was designed by Nanomaster01 with the help of Lux. Kira's helmet was especially tricky as we didn't have much to work with in Minecraft, and it was modelled by Zofikat who was able to get a design that looked very close to the concept, but still blended nicely with the Minecraft aesthetic. Her daggers went through various designs before landing on one that maintained a nice curve and featured a distinct energy crystal in the centre. Chip was such a joy to see come to life. His concept was designed by Young, whom I'm extremely proud of because the design is just spot on. We started with a bunch of digital faces on the front of the cube, but I wanted something a bit more physicalized since Owen is the one who built him out of parts that he found on his travels. His color scheme matches that of Owen for the same reason. We gave him ears that can move and side attachments which come out of the, well, the side. Um, that come in handy on missions and the ability to project holograms which never really made it into this installment. But the biggest feature was the transforming legs which turned into a jetpack. Chip was modelled and rigged by Zofikat and it was definitely one of the most complex rigs with a lot of controllers all over the place. She really did an incredible job. Chip was voiced by David RB and coming up with the sound he would make was honestly... <laughs> I sat in a call with Dan and David and we just... It went through a bunch of nonsense until we found something that actually stuck. Maybe it can be more in the throat. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's grim. I guess that's where grim came from. <laughs> Chip, get the door! <laughs> and there's something well, hold on. I can do it with the tongue, I can do it without the tongue. I think I can do more like a... Or I can do like a... Uh, so Sounds like he's in pain. <laughs> it's turning into like a cat. Chip, get the door. Uh -huh. <laughs> I gotta, kind I of Mickey Mouse. Yeah, if I do a hoo-hoo, it sounds like. Oh. <laughs> you only get so much energy out because your mouth is closed. So. <laughs> you can put that in as a blooper. And his name is <laughs> The Striders were next, and each Strider needed to be distinct, with a unique skin and weapon to match. But most importantly, they needed a leader. Garn needed to show a lot of age and experience, from the tears in his clothes, to the parts of his body that he's been forced to replace with cybernetics throughout the years as working as a strider. He has a cigar in the artwork, but honestly I thought it looked a bit daft in Minecraft, so I kinda left that out. The concept was drawn by Kurt, and the skin was designed by Lux. His weapon was large and powerful, and had the same energy that I used in uh, Worlds Apart, and that was modelled by RedBlue115. Ah, oh, another one. The other Strider concepts were done by Kurt and Frizzle. They both managed to create so many unique designs, each with a distinct colour palette. The skins were created by Nemori, Fred VA, Nanomaster01 and Lux, who all did an amazing job. All Strider weapons were modelled by RedBlue115, apart from the Energy Blade, which I did myself. He did a fantastic job matching the concept super well. I hope we get to see them in action in future episodes. Owen needed a ship, and I was finding it very difficult to make one using Minecraft blocks and still have it be small enough to retain a lot of detail. I made the design to have it. I made the design. I made the decision to have it modeled, and we started on the concepts. I worked with Flair on some of the early designs, and we tried to get a good silhouette right before going any further. When Flair left the project, I started working with Frizzle on the Atlas design. Some of the key elements from before were maintained, but we made a lot of additions as well. The silhouette reflected an A shape, which was appropriate given the name of the ship. I love the idea of having wings that, that, you know, transformed into big landing gears, and we had 38 different colour schemes to choose from. Some were more rustic to show age on the ship, but we went with a cleaner look, which kind of matched Owen's colour scheme as well. Since the ship was intended as one for explorers, given the name, we had a map room for navigation, we had a cargo bay room for all the loot, 
cockpit to fly the ship, and a workshop for Owen to build new tools and weapons, all of which Frizzle designed concepts for. After the concepts were finished, it was finally time to model the beast. I contacted Finn to take on this enormous challenge, and it's honestly incredible how he managed to create such an amazing model in the time that we had. We spent many months going back and forth on the design. Not only was the exterior required, but the interior as well, and it all had to fit in the same model. One of the issues we ran into was having the interior and the exterior not match perfectly, so Finn came up with a solution to hide the exterior when we're inside the ship, and vice versa. So every time we cut between the inside and the outside, the corresponding one would disappear, and I'm just generally just incredibly pleased with how the Atlas turned out. It's such an iconic ship, and I'm really grateful that Finn spent the amount of time that he did on this. But he's not done yet. The Strider we see in the opening, it has a unique ship as well. Frizzle was the one to concept this, and I said to him, I, I really want like an X-shaped ship. So he made a ton of different designs, and the one we landed on is one of my favourites of the animation. Finn tackled the modelling again, and put together yet another amazing ship. The weapon extends from underneath, and the cockpit makes up the full size of the interior. It even has this cool transforming glass to enter and exit the ship. Starfall also introduces two key factions, the Arcturan Union and the Saimari Collective, both of which have concepts created by Kurt. The Union represents order, so they had a much cleaner military style to them, whereas the Saimari are a faction that explores cybernetics and integrating with technology. So they looked much more technical with paler skin to show how the technology has kind of affected their physiology. Nano created skins for the Union, and Lux did so for the Saimari. The Union had pretty standard issue weapons, which were modelled by Red Blue or Mon 5, and both of these groups will be explored much more heavily if the story continues. The Dread Pack are a group of space pirates that use cheap, rusty technology, but with a large population within the group. The concepts are made. I bumped my microphone! The concepts were made by Frizzle, with the skins being designed by Lux. They're made up of two species known as the Raptors and the Bygones, the first being the big lizard boys and the latter being the little buggy boys. The aesthetic was much more dangerous, which translated into their red colour scheme. Their weapon designs reflected that as well, concepted by Kurt and modelled by Red Blue 115. Both the mech and the drones were designed with the same ideas in mind. Frizzle came up with the concepts for both, and we landed on something that really gave a rusty look. The mech was modelled and rigged by Finn, and the drone by Zofikat. Both turned out super well. We also had a lot of additional civilian designs for the different locations, as well as a few skins made for them. But underneath all the brainstorming and art design, the building had begun. Building the world of Starfall was a colossal task. Not only were the sets extremely large, but extremely unique as well. I've never really seen anything quite like this done in Minecraft before. However, I was able to rally a team of talented builders, and together, we got started. One of the design goals for Starfall was to make sure that each location was unique and had a distinct colour palette, using red for the derelict ship, blue for the spaceport, and green for the planet Malagor. We started with the spaceport, which didn't actually have a concept drawn for it. I found references online, and after ironing out some of the basics, it started to take shape. This was a circular build, so I've already lost street cred with the build team having to put them through this nightmare. <laughs> it's definitely one of the most remarkable builds they made, and the sheer scale of it all is just huge. But the circles had just begun. Next up was the warp gate. Frizzle was the one to concept this, so you can kind of put some of the blame on him. He's the one who drew it as a circle, not me. I'm, I'm not the person who told him to draw it as a circle. Absolutely not. We tried going for a different shapes, but to keep it consistent, we went with another circle. You know, before the spaceport was built, we had a nice little spawn area. Oh, it's so pleasant. Look at all the little flowers and the bright colors. And then we went to the warp gate, and after the circle nightmare, the the vibe of the spawn was very different. We started with a tiny warp gate as reference, and then we used that to get the key proportions right. Though one section had to be done several times over, and on a scale that big, it was definitely awkward for the builders. The giant space gun was next, which was arguably one of the most awkward builds to make. Anything that involved floating in midair was extremely challenging. Frizzle also designed this one, 
It started out as just a big gun that floated in space, but it later incorporated a space station, so it felt a bit more like a kind of space headquarters than just, you know, a, a, a big whopping cannon. We started with the railgun section first, leaving some space in the middle for the space station to go. But the thing is, we were still building in Minecraft uh, version 1.16.5, so the world height wasn't really big enough for the whole thing. We had to split the build in two, and then I merged them together in Blender. It was incredibly complex, and the builders kept a log of our progress inside the railgun because it was taking so long. If you thought the spaceport was complicated, oh blimey, here comes the geothermal station. Here comes the hexagons. The concept art for this was created by Nemori, and they really nailed the foggy, polluted look, which was the initial direction for this area. The geothermal station was the first map to have the environment made using World Painter. I wanted a really huge crater in the center that went down into a big pit. It's, it's, it's just a pit. And just a big pit. And it was surrounded by lots of sharp mountains to make it look extremely dangerous. After some terrain editing inside the crater, thanks logs, laying out this beast was very awkward. First we had circles, and now we have hexagons. God, the builders must hate me. <laughs> but the most difficult part was getting the arms to connect from the really awkward angles, because most of them weren't using nice 90 degree angles. The dedication of the builders to make them look nice was just amazing. We dubbed this one the Christmas Cow because of the white and black block pattern and the large growing trapezium in the center. The interior was done completely separately since it wasn't going to match the exterior at all and that gave us much more flexibility when designing it. We had this giant reactor in the ceiling at the top of the elevator, which we went through various designs but it's a shame we can't see it too much in the actual animation. It was around this time that I started to work on Pirate Derp, which is the animation I did between the first half of Starfall production and the second half, and once we wrapped up that animation, I recruited a second wave of builders. And this is what really made a huge difference in how much we, in how much we were able to get done. We moved on to the next build, which was the town of Ratuga, the first place they go to when they arrive at Malagor. I started in World Painter again and created large flat wastelands surrounded by the mountains that you see near the geothermal station. Frizzle created a very accurate concept for the town which made it a lot easier for the builders to directly replicate structures from the reference. I even went on holiday at the time, and when I got back, most of the build had already been finished. And then we went around and destroyed everyone's hard work because they had to make the city look run down. This was also the place where Garn and his striders were located. The concept for the Strider hideout was done by Lost in Time. I really liked the holy kind of location look, but it had a very dangerous aesthetic to it. Everything was centered around the throne at the back, even having a unique pattern in the wall behind it. Building this was a nice breather from the large sets, focusing on high detail and figuring out how to let light into such a small space. Although, when it came time to lighting the scene, it was extremely awkward because there was just one hole in the wall and I couldn't figure out how to put more light in. Next was the giant derelict ship that we see in the opening. This was another large floating build, but to add to the complexity, it also had to look broken in half and left there for many years. You know, it ended up looking like a giant space whale. Or something else. <laughs> it looks like Jar Jar Binks. Oh. <laughs> it does. <laughs> He's got his big mouth. Once the exterior was laid out, we designed the interior. This is one where the interior had to match the exterior, since characters enter and exit the location, and there's a giant hole in the middle, so laying it out was pretty tricky. Again, we tore it to pieces afterwards so it looked more derelict. The next build was the largest and most complicated of all the builds, and ironically only shows up for a few seconds at the very end of the animation, the Arcturan City. This was huge. For the longest time, I was using the world painted map in my animation layout since the build was still ongoing. The initial concept was designed by Nemori. I told them I wanted a city integrated into large spires with a lush, green environment around them. Eventually, the floor mist became a huge part of the design as well. I world painted the spires and left a lot of the map alone for the most part. When it came time to do the city layout, I realized just how important a design was that matched the terrain I had built. So I gave Frizzle a screenshot of the world, and he drew a city layout to match the two main spires in the center. 
We designed a path network that used 45 degree angles, we made a monorail system to bring life to the scene, we made expensive looking properties next to green spaces, and even managed to squeeze a circle or two for consistency. Laying out this enormous building was a huge task. Luke, one of the builders, handled this, and the thing is, none of the builders knew the ending sequence at all. So <laughs> having their city just completely wiped out was especially fun to listen to during the watch party. You didn't tell me <laughs> that the nice pretty planet was gonna be blown up! <laughs> <laughs> this is absolutely my favorite build of all of them. There's just so much detail and pretty walkable areas. The builders even left little settlements around the map. They really outdid themselves with, with all the builds really. To close things off with the building phase, at least among the build team, there was one final chill build to do, which was the Saimari Bridge that we see at the very end. I was glad that we had something much easier as our final build, so we could just relax and look back on everything we'd built up to that point. I was honestly very nervous when starting this project because I hadn't seen many sci-fi looking builds around. The ones that were were really good, but they were few and far between. But I'm happy to say that the build team proved me wrong. We had so many talented people contribute so many hours of their time to this project. I'm extremely grateful for their dedication, and this wouldn't have been possible without their input. And everything looking like a face. <laughs> oh, now it looks like it's staring into your soul. And the goofing off. Ah, oh my god, there's heads coming out of the cannons! Oh my god, it's my head! Stop putting my head in front of guns! <laughs> Don't encourage the builders. Oh no! <laughs> oh no! <laughs> oh boy, that wasn't supposed to happen. They must be working so hard on their projects! Yeah, look at this stupid face! <laughs> this is why I have to be online while they're building, otherwise this happens. <laughs> Towards the end of production, I still needed the giant battleships that we see in the Arcturan spaceport and in the ending sequence. The concept art for these was all done by Frizzle. He designed four amazing ship designs, but sadly only three made it into the animation due to time constraints. We didn't have much time left, so I looked on Planet Minecraft as kind of a last resort to see if anyone had made giant spaceships before, and honestly to my amazement there was an extremely talented builder called Scalord who made these incredible space builds. I reached out and, to my surprise, they actually agreed to help build the ships for me. These things are crazy huge, like they're so enormous, even with the new world height, one of them still had to be chopped in half. The incredible amount of detail on these ships cannot be understated, it's absolutely astounding, and they match the concept art just perfectly. I'm really thankful that they agreed to help me, otherwise these ships would have never made it in time for release. You can check out their page in the description below. And with that, it's time for the scene breakdown. In this section, I'll be going through each scene and just talking a bit about how it was made and what decisions went into it. I will mention that a lot of the visuals, including the planets, the wormhole, the asteroid field and a few others, were taught using a course I bought called Space VFX Elements by Creative Shrimp. I'll leave a link to it in the description for those of you that are interested in learning more about that, so I won't be able to show you how I made those visuals, but I can talk about the rest. I'll also mention that I won't be covering any of the music or the sound design stuff, because After Infinity, who composed and did sound design, will be putting together a music and sound behind the scenes over on his channel. I'll link it here when that's been uploaded. But otherwise, let's start with the derelict ship. The opening shot had concept art created by Lost in Time, which really nailed the derelict feel. The environment was made up of an asteroid field and a few other things from the Space VFX course that I mentioned. Things were looking a little empty and lifeless, so David suggested adding random junk that's floating around which really gave life to the scene. One of the things I struggled with was trying to light the interior. Since it's such a dark setting, I really didn't know where the light was going to come from. So I thought, oh, it'd be pretty nice to have floating lanterns be part of the debris. And then I could just place the lanterns wherever I needed them. And it would make sense because it's just floating around in space, which made lighting really easy. The custom doors were modeled by Finn, and when one of them blows up, 
I keyframed some sunbeams to come on when the light shines through the door, which I think helped make the explosion look a little prettier. And the explosion itself was a mix of a few different particle systems. The first was a flak explosion effect that Thomas had made. There was an aggressium song that I liked that I used the energy from that David made. And I had two other systems of embers and smoke particles. The environment has a lot of additional spaceship junk that I added all of which were created by the builders. The scene was animated by Instinct, with a bit of additional animation by Zillion, who both absolutely nailed it. The faces were done by Zillion with some polish on my end, and this was the first time that I've done lip sync in an animation, and honestly, I found it really satisfying. I'd parent a camera to the character's face and animate by making the sounds and poses with my face. So I'd be like, oh, why I am I and honestly, it probably annoyed a lot of people in voice lounges, but it, it was really helpful. The Atlas engine effects were a mixture of a previous asset that I made from Worlds Apart, and I turned it blue, and then I used a principled volume shader that was in a cube, which had some noise textures that simulated flames. The same effect was used for the Strider ship and ship's jetpack boosters, and honestly every single engine in the whole thing. <laughs> The Atlas screens were created thanks to a pack that David sent me with a bunch of different UI elements. And if you look closely at the screens, there are a few easter eggs. The projectile from the Strider ship was again a mixture of Varix cannon from Worlds Apart and an Aggressium song from Songs of War. The purpose of this scene was to establish where Owen is at in his life. He's searching through old derelict ships for supplies, to either sell or repurpose, but he's also being pursued by someone who he thinks is after his loot, but we later find out is a strider hired by Garn to hunt him down. It also doubles as Owen taking huge risks just to find a suitable replacement for Chip's missing ear. The next scene showed the result of Owen's adventure. It was important to establish the bond that Owen and Chip have here, whilst also showing how difficult things are currently for Owen. The scene was one of the few that used real volumetrics. The entire room was inside a volumetric cube, so some of the light sources created actual volume. It's one of my favourite scenes lighting-wise. I tried to give the room a lot of personality and character, putting up blueprints of Chip's concept art on the wall to show that it was Owen that actually built Chip, along with his own weapons. Owen's sail chest was one that Thomas had originally made, and I retextured it and put some broken text on the front. There were a few easter eggs too, like the companion cube, some Worlds Apart models, an old render from an early sci-fi story concept called Derelict. Both clocks were also set to 239. I modelled a bunch of tools and scraps to litter around the place to show that he had a messy working environment, and a lot of his loot was honestly pretty useless. Finn also modelled a lot of custom items for the room as well. We then travelled to the Arcturan spaceport. I was able to fill the scene with the amazing ship builds that the team had put together, along with some smaller ones from a collection that Scalod actually allowed me to use. I used two sun lamps to light the scene, one key orange light and a sort of blue fill light in the opposite direction to add some shape to the subjects, which was being cast by the environment. The space backgrounds throughout Star 4 were made using a combination of multiple Voronoi textures to create the stars and multiple noise textures at different intensities to create the space clouds. The asteroid was made by making a low poly asteroid and using the remesh modifier to turn it into blocks. To get the spaceport to actually fit inside the asteroid, I took a cylinder and used the boolean modifier to poke a hole through the asteroid, and then the spaceport fit into it nicely. This was also one of the scenes I used render layers for, as I wanted certain things to be lit with different lights and different colours. The spaceport scene was animated by Pixel, and Chip's animation was done by Zofiecat. This one had a lot of background activities going on with lots of different characters, things like the crane moving and people being questioned at the barriers. The other ships in the scene were also mostly references to other media. There were a few cameos too, like Mass Effect, Derp, and Worlds Apart. Lighting this was honestly pretty tricky. The arches in the middle works nicely as light sources for the central platform, but it wasn't really lighting the landing pads themselves, so I added these sort of lamppost looking things at the corners of the landing pads so that the platforms weren't too dark. It's also filled with lots of fake volumetrics. The TV projector was just an image sequence that was layered with one of the UI elements from the Atlas monitors. This scene is when we're introduced to Owen's friend, Kira. I wanted to make sure that their dynamic gave off a very playful sassiness, as well as convey a lot of history between the two. 
Her cloaking ability was made with some emissive noise textures on her skin. The electricity around her was a different kind of noise texture, and there was also this 2D plane that glowed at the base of her to light up the effect a little bit more. At this point, the Arcturian Union shows up to interfere with Owen a little bit, and the purpose was really to show that although Owen has become part of this society, he's still an outlaw stuck in a few bad old habits. He's still conflicted with who he is as a person, and he struggled to adapt to this new life of order. Having Kira steal the weapon bat was a nod to their friendship. She's willing to help him out of danger. And of course, having a moment with Chip was important to show Kira's compassion. I always love doing hologram effects, they're just really cool in sci-fi. So I wanted a scene where they use the holotable. The planet was made from the same texture as the Malagor one that we see later, but the texture was baked in that scene, and then added as an image in this one. The fog around the planet was a sphere with a principled volume inside, which had an animated noise texture to give some motion. The elements around the planet were a few emissive 2D rings, and the 2D volumetric was below to cast the hologram from above. This scene was another I was really happy with lighting-wise. I used another volumetric cube to create actual volumes, and did a bunch of spotlighting on the characters. One thing that I've tried to do consistently with Starfall was to have more than one light being cast on the characters to add more dimension to them, like an orange light on Owen's face, and then a blue light coming from behind him. This scene was animated by JCR, Luke, and myself, with faces being done by Pixel. I'm very happy with how the animation turned out, as it was honestly a scene with a lot of changes in moods, and it went from a calm, kind of informative vibe, and then when Owen hears about the Striders, it gets a little somber, and then it gets more kind of uplifting towards the end as Owen agrees to help her. And this was to introduce a bit of Owen's past and history with the Striders, creating the tension needed between him and Kira. It also showcases Kira's ability to persuade others to get what she wants. And with that, they set off on their adventure. The warp gate was heavily inspired by mass effects, mass relays, especially the sequence of the Atlas approaching it. I know I said I wouldn't talk about sounds, but just listen to how cool this is. The warp gate effect was made mostly from lots of particles. There are a few force fields in the center, like a vortex and turbulence, and I keyframed key key a force force field to suck the particles in and then explode outwards at the end. It was all encased in a volumetric cylinder as well, which gave it this nice glow. The beam at the end was also a cylinder, with some emission moving across it very fast. The wormhole effect was created using techniques that I learned on the Space VFX course, so I won't be going into that. When we come out the other end, we're greeted with the planet Malagor. This was initially going to be a desert world, with orange being the key colour instead of green. The planet designs were of course, as I mentioned as well, from the pack that I bought. This is where things shift in tone, as the story really gets started. Luke was the one to animate both scenes on either side of the warp gate. Landing on Malagor was blimmin' awkward. The opening shot had the largest map I've ever imported into Blender. I duplicated the main map multiple times and then used instances to keep the scene from lagging so much. This map changed a lot from Minecraft and went from a very sandy, kind of brownish look to a more bluey grey look to match the planet's design. It was always cloudy and dark, with only lanterns lighting the centre of town. The character and face animation here was done by Instinct, with Chip being done by Sims. The purpose here was to contrast the spaceport scene. The place is lawless, so everyone is free to do as they please. It was intended to feel dangerous and worn down, with buildings and terrain having missing pieces. We're then introduced to the Striders. This was the scene I was most anxious about because it's five minutes straight of nothing but dialogue, and I was hoping that the writing would keep people interested. Initially, the scene was going to be much more orange and golden, with this big gold rays coming through the hole in the back, but I stumbled across a really dark blue which I instantly liked. It made the place feel cold, with mist adding it some chill as well, and it contrasted well with Garn's orange. There's a symbol in the back wall, which serves as a visual cue that we're at the Strider's location. When Garrett gets vaporised, I used a similar explosion to the one in the opening, but had things flow upwards more quickly to reveal just his absolute destruction. <laughs> the lighting behind Garn created a nice silhouette for his throne, 
I used a glowing 2D plane to illuminate the edges of the throne, and some fake volumetrics to show the light coming through the hole in the wall. Titan was the one to animate this, and I'm really impressed with how much he was able to do to this quality, given how long the scene is. It was important to keep Gon sitting down for the majority of the scene, like he's just not very interested, for him only to stand when he's deeply offended by Owen's actions. This whole exchange was a back and forth of, I know this and you don't, yeah but I know this and you knew that I know this and you don't, <laughs> well you don't know that I know that you know that I know. Having Owen interrupt at the end really spoke volume about who he was as a person in contrast to Kira, showing that he was an honest character and Kira was not. When we leave the guild, we see the contrast in worldviews that both Owen and Kira have, and we can see some of the tensions starting to kind of come to the surface. Maybe there's some past resentment between the two, or maybe things didn't go so well in a previous mission. This is when things start to get a little suspicious around Kira, and this whole bit was animated by Sims and he did a great job. Kira really wants Owen to return to the past, but she just can't accept that he's changed. The tone really starts to feel ominous from here on out. The toxic wastelands on Malagor were made up of several copies of the same map that just stretch on for miles. The mountains in the background were from the previous map, just scaled up to look really far away. The mist was animated quite a bit here to show the toxic fumes coming out of the pits below. I gave the geothermal station lots of green emission, which really added to the dangerous atmosphere. The scene was lit with really dim blue sunlamp and a really bright green point light that was beneath the base. I ripped one of the arms off the station and had it swinging from side to side to show the age of this place. Beneath the base had a black noise texture to simulate burn marks from the base having been there for a while. This base was intended to have been built by a much more advanced faction that had since abandoned it and it had been taken over by the Dread Pack. I ended up changing the textures on the base for the interior and the landing pad because the characters weren't really showing up too well against the white block type. This whole scene was animated by Outline45, along with the next section which was Kira's ritual. This is something that she has kept herself from her people's culture. I made the coral emissive and colourful to create a contrast of colours in the sequence. Her symbol beneath her was designed by Kurt when we were coming up with merch designs. The electricity effect was a purple version of an aggressium song that was slowed down to look much more harmonious. There was also an added glow effect from a 2D plane, and the helmet effect was designed by Finn. There's a controller that when moved it changes the effect on the helmet, and there's this emissive kind of line that sits between the transparent area of the helmet and the solid section, so that it's this nice like glowy transition. And then the fights begin. These were of course done by myself and nobody else, and so good at fun. It was all done by Zillion. The sections in between the fights were done by Chico, Sims, Outline, and Pixel. We spent a long time discussing how we wanted the characters to fight, with Kira being much more stylish and acrobatic, with Owen playing more of a support role. It was important for the Dread Pack to also feel like a threat, so they get the upper hand at various stages during the fight. The Raptars were similar to the Brutes from Halo, as they enter a rage mode when they lose their weapon and charge their enemy. The Raptars also had a weak spot in their back, which was the only way to kill them. This wasn't really made as clear as I would have liked, but every time that one is killed, it's always in the back. Apart from this guy, who now has to start a new life underneath the mech. Maybe that could be a spin-off story. The Bygone served as the grunt fodder, since they're based on bugs which would overwhelm enemies by their sheer numbers. They served as the main bulk of the force, with the Raptars acting more as leaders of the pack. Owen's sniper beam was a modified version of the one from Worlds Apart, to save time towards the end honestly, and his rifle, along with every other blaster in the animation, shot these long emissive bullets that were keyframed by Zillion and Pixel. His shotgun effect was an edited scattershot song effect that served as a fiery shotgun blast. Kira's magnetic daggers played a huge role in her fighting style, it gave her a lot of freedom to control the fights. I gave Kira this signature pose that she uses about halfway through the fight, which gave her a bit of style to her kind of fighting style, I suppose. It was key to show them working together, 
like this was natural for them after being a team for years, which is especially prominent in the final bit of combat for that section. The interior lighting for all scenes inside the station consisted of the energy harvested casting green light from the corners with some blue point lights to fill in the gaps. When we head upstairs we get a nice bit of banter between Owen and Kira before introducing the mech. I really wanted a boss fight to top off this part of the action and design the map almost like a boss room because of it. Planning out this fight took us a long time. Zillion and I had several calls and we drew on this kind of top down map of the room with all these little coloured lines to show where the characters will be at certain times. And the goal was really to have each character distract the mech so the other could get an attack in. As Kira kind of stole the spotlight in the previous scene, I wanted Owen to be the one to finish off the mech. I sometimes like to mix in a bit of humour into the fights, especially since Owen is more of a playful character. The mech's minigun was a particle system, and the cannon used similar design to the one that the Strider ship used in the opening. Finn helped out with the rigid body simulation after the pillar was destroyed. To be fair, I just like changing the environment in fights, it makes it a bit more dynamic. When the fight dies down, they find what they're looking for. I left this room empty apart from the asset to really highlight what was in the center. The asset, or EMP as we later discover, was modeled by DJ. He also did the rotating glowing purple effect on the interior, along with the crate opening sequence. It has this kind of emission that it turns on when it starts to scale down and looks a little more digital. This is when things really start to get suspicious, as Owen starts to notice that something's just not quite right with this whole thing. It was animated by Sims, who was able to get that kind of subtle sussy vibe across really well. As things quietened down, we're met with just a little bit more danger. This part was animated by Pixel, with Chip done by Zofiecap. The drone projectiles were taken from the opening, as this scene was done about two or three days before the release with the explosion being made up of a similar set of elements from the opening as well. The drones themselves initially had blue lights, along with the mech, but I thought that there was just too much blue in the animation already, so I made them red, which also matched the Dread Pack's colour scheme a lot better. This fight is probably my f I don't know, I like all the fights, but it's it's it, it might be my favourite. I temp scored the entire scene with the original Vindicator song that After Infinity made, as the structure of the fight was pretty complex because it cut between the different characters, and then it cut between the perspectives of the Atlas as well as Kira, who was trying to get the EMP into the back of the Atlas. The pit was extended thanks to a technique that Finn suggested where it took a cylinder, I hollowed it out and I applied a remesh modifier. The map was keyframed up every camera cut to fake the true depth of the pit. I did notice that they weren't falling very fast and I could have keyframed the map to go even faster and maybe extended it a little bit lower. Lighting this was a little different to before. I didn't use a point light, instead I used a green area light that cast light pretty evenly from the base. And then I used a blue sun lamp that was pointing pretty directly down, and then I made the map above not cast any shadows so that I could have a nice even lighting underneath. After all the adrenaline, it was time to slow things down. This part was animated by Pixel, and we kept the aftermath pretty quiet to allude to something sinister lurking beneath all the fun, giving them one final playful exchange before Kira accepts what she has to do. The final sequence was the one that I'm most proud of. It was crucial to pace this part appropriately, starting with that equilibrium and slowly adding more and more hints of tension until the big moment happened, which I'll get to in a bit. The planet was again made from the Space VFX course, but the warp gate effect was toned down a bit for ships exiting instead of entering, also due to time constraints, honestly. It still had the emissive cylinder for the beam when it comes in, but I used 2D planes to light it up when the ships fly through. The lighting was similar to the spaceport scene, with an orange key light and a blue fill light. This scene was made up of four different render layers, since I wanted the planet, the Arcturan ships, the Saimari ships, and the Atlas plus the interior to have different lighting setups. The compositing was just a mess. I gave this scene to Pixel, who executed it brilliantly. The railgun effect was made up of Kira's ritual effect turned blue, and the animation of the texture sped up, 
as well as the flame from the Atlas engines. Kira's EMP also had the ritual effect added later on in the activation to show that it was becoming more chaotic as it was building up to the blast. The actual EMP blast was created using several circles with electrical noise textures that I scaled up and faded out over time when it went on. When the Saimari ships arrived, I gave them a really bright light underneath which made them look much more sinister as the fronts were mostly completely black. The Atlas re-entry burn was a combination of the engine effect that I've been using and a part of Thomas's muzzle flash effect that he used in Cyber Heist. This ending sequence was animated by Parfi, with faces done by Luke and Chip done by Pixel. This whole scene on the planet was the laggiest, glitchiest, most crash inducing scene I've ever worked with. The map was huge, the floor mist was really laggy, but honestly I think it was worth dealing with because I'm super happy with the lighting. Initially it was much more of a sunset mood, but I really wanted a bright and sunny lush environment to completely and utterly destroy. I used 2D planes to create the clouds, but I also put some clouds on a separate mist layer and then I faded them out in this shot to simulate the atlas flying through the cloud which then reveals the map below. The floor had a huge set of cloud planes which were on both the X and the Y axis, which I then scaled and repositioned in every shot to create the thick white clouds that we see everywhere. The Atlas crash had a bit of manual animation as the escape pod kind of flew to the side and the ship kind of tilted up and slapped onto the ground, but it was mostly made up of a few particle systems including dirt and smoke to really create the full effect. The falling fleet debris was made from the big Arcturan ships, I chopped them up into several pieces and then I gave them a flame effect that was similar to the one on the re-entry burn but with much slower animation on the texture. This was the money shot. I added 2D planes of fire and smoke particles scattered all over the city, I put a ton of falling debris in the background, the destruction simulation was added which was done by separating three sections of the building and then I used the explode quick effect to destroy them. This was mixed with a particle system for both the embers and smoke. I keyframed some sunbeams to come on in the top left hand corner as well. The shots at the very end were some key wallpaper shots with 2D planes of fire being added on the fleet debris, a 2D glow behind the Saimari mothership, and then one of my favourite shots of the animation with the planet framing the shot really well, and finally the reveal of the antagonist, Kira. Kira's betrayal was really crucial to Starfall. We never see her face during the entire ending sequence besides the very last shot of the animation. A lot of people picked up on that which I'm super happy about. Even when she's in frame, she's wearing her mask to hide her emotions during that moment. From the moment she stabs Owen, she doesn't hesitate to carry through her plan. Kira's actions have really taken Owen's situation from bad to worse. He was already struggling with simply getting by in life, but now he has the Striders on his back, the Union thinks he's responsible for destroying their fleet, and most importantly, one of the few people he had left in his life, someone whom he trusted with his life, took advantage of him and threw his trust out the window. He's feeling angry at Kira for betraying him, responsibility for her actions, fear of being hunted by the Striders, and it's given him major trust and attachment issues. But at least he still has his buddy Chip. Thank you everyone who made it this far into the video. And a massive thank you to everyone who's seen Starfall, reacted to Starfall, or who've shared their thoughts with me on the Discord. This really wouldn't have been possible without all the talented people who helped bring this to life. Thank you all so much. There are still a few more videos coming out related to Starfall. There's a few music videos. There's the music and sound behind the scenes from After Infinity. There's a director's commentary and just a few silly things here and there. This is a story that I would love to continue, but there is absolutely no guarantee of that happening. Starfall was made as a pilot, and if there's enough interest in the project, along with it being financially feasible, I'm very much interested in doing more. If you'd like to support Starfall, one of the easiest ways to do that is to simply watch the video, share it with your friends, share it with your family. But honestly, that will most likely not be enough on its own to ensure the continuation of it. You can also pledge to our Patreon, 
or you can buy the Star Form merchandise. We have some amazing designs that Kurt drew on t-shirts and mugs and stickers and there's this awesome movie poster. There may also be a plushie in the next few months, but we'll see. Getting some merch would absolutely help cover the cost of making Starfall, as well as potentially allowing the creation of more episodes. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll hopefully see you in future Starfall animations.